Hello, ladies and gentlemen, uh, reverend fathers. We have some reverend fathers, I assume. I see one. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening here at uh, Heritage Hall. Uh, and thank you also to, the, uh, to those of you who are joining us via live stream. My name is Matthew Walther, editor of The Lamp Magazine, and I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Tom Shakely, Chief Engagement Officer at Americans United for Life. I'm not really sure what that title means, but I'd like to think it means that he's some kind of matchmaker, which if you look at the sort of uh, delayed trends in marriage among people in roughly our uh, demographic range might not be such a bad undertaking for a pro-life organization. Um, and by Megan McArdle, a uh, columnist at the Washington Post. Um, my presence as a moderator this evening is unfortunately required, and Tom's organization was directly responsible for inspiring tonight's event. Otherwise, I would consider uh, his and my presence on the stage this evening unnecessary and invite Megan to discuss the issue, maybe with a glass of wine or two with the women in our audience. Uh, maybe next time. <laughs> um, anyway, if I'm not mistaken, this is the third time that uh, the Institute for Human Ecology here at CUA has been gracious enough to host uh, staff, contributors, friends, and of course, readers of the Lamp Magazine. Uh, so thank you to uh, Joe Capizzi, our fearless executive director, to Stephen Jean-Marie, Jean-Henry, Suzanne, and everyone else. Um, in the name of gratitude, I'm going to hold off on the joke I was going to make about Stephen's vehicle having been towed, <laughs> just because I don't know what car he drives, so it wouldn't land. Um, anyway, rights and penumbras aside, tonight's uh, topic is free birth or more properly written Jeopardy style in the form of a question, should birth be free? Uh, I should say at the outset that when I told my wife, uh, who's on call for a weekly volunteer shift as a birth assistant to a midwife who practices near us, uh, that the lamp, I told her the lamp was doing an event on free birth, and she was very intrigued and also sounded a little puzzled. How on earth did that get on your radar, she asked. And I told her, honey, everybody is talking about free birth. Social conservatives, uh, esteemed pro-life organizations, Marxist online magazines, all six remaining pro-life Democrats are wildly enthusiastic about it. And she said, okay, but this is out there in DC. Are they doing this in apartments or somebody's garage or what? And that was when I realized that by free birth, she meant something very different. Uh, <laughs> in the world of midwifery, free birth refers to sort of Amazonian women having thrown off righteously the shackles of big obstetrics, big hospital, big pharma, and goodness knows what else, find that they no longer require, e require big midwifery either and choose to give birth entirely unassisted. Uh, no drugs, no interventions, not even your aunt holding your hand. If you can imagine uh, the conditions under which Sieglinda is likely to have given birth to her strong son at some point be between the end of De Valkyra and the beginning of Siegfried, uh, you'll get the idea. Anyway, I assume that most of these women don't envision that their sons or daughters will end up being educated by dwarves who intend to exploit them in order to acquire ancient family heirlooms from dragons. No, um, so descending from this sort of sublime romantic heights of free birth, uh, our subject is something more grave and sublunary. The actual specific conditions for the provision of medical care, who pays for it, how much, the logistics, and so on. Uh, which brings us back to the title, should birth be free, in the sense of that uh, no cost at the point of delivery to the women who are giving birth. What might be the motivations behind such a policy? How would it compare to the means for the provision of such care in other countries? Uh, I hope that in the course of the evening, we're able to discuss these and other questions. With that, I turn things over first to Tom. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, yeah, so the question is a provocative one, right? Should birth be free? And we're here to talk about birth, uh, of course. But when we talk about birth, uh, I think it's helpful to take a step back and to really ground the conversation. Uh, birth 
sort of sounds abstract without the context. We're talking about the birth of human beings, human persons. Human persons born into families, human persons born into communities, into our political community, which is to say into our, our country, America. This joint project that we're all involved with here together every day, trying to strengthen, uh, some of us maybe trying to weaken the social fabric, but most of us hopefully strengthening it. And I'm here because I believe that making birth free for mothers at the point of delivery, as Matthew says, to fathers, of course, to families, is a way to strengthen uh, our social fabric, not just for families, but for our whole country. And so with that, I'll explain a little bit where this came from, and I think uh, the twofold reason why I think it makes sense to answer affirmatively, unabashedly, uh, excitedly even, yes, birth should be free, and we can do it. Congress can do it. So the first reason is from a pro-life standpoint. Matthew mentioned Americans United for Life and my kind of nebulous title of chief engagement officer. Not matchmaking, unfortunately, but you know, engagement for us is about public engagement. It's about communications. It's about casting a vision for our country, for the pro-life movement, certainly. And the pro-life movement, as all of us here know, is at a crossroads. The Supreme Court handed us as a movement and America as a nation something that many people thought wasn't going to happen, period. A lot of people said, not in my lifetime, by which they really meant not going to happen, period. And yet it did. Roe v. Wade has been reversed. It was recognized for the false constitutional anthropology that it was. And now we're living in a world after Roe. We're living in a post-Dobbs world. What does that mean? You know, the vision I think that many pro-lifers had, which was that after Roe, abortion might be more substantively, more affirmatively abolished, that hasn't come to pass yet. The Supreme Court handed us a decision that from my perspective, unfortunately, made abortion a continuing issue. It's made it one that's gonna continue to be debated and royal us as a people, probably for the rest of our lives, for decades to come, as states, fight about what abortion is, what the human person is, what we owe one another. The same debate we've been having on a national level, except now we can't blame seven men on the Supreme Court from 1973 or nine justices in general. It's on us. And so for the pro-life movement, as the movement as a whole continues to work toward the social vision that it's had since 1973, which is to say the abolition of abortion among a whole range of other goods across the spectrum of human right to life issues, as we work toward abolition, which is a distant goal from a national standpoint, what are we gonna do in the meantime? What are the things that we have to offer one another in the meantime? When something is an ill, an evil, certainly like abortion is, it makes sense to ban it. Right? We were having a conversation before this about things like cigarettes, right? Many people made a strong case that cigarettes were a social ill. They were a scourge. Many people rightly disagree. And, you know, when people look and they see something that they think is an ill, they say, we shouldn't have this anymore. And so bans make sense. There's a place for bans. We should continue to prioritize those when it comes to the destruction of human life. But we need to offer something substantive. And so making birth free from a pro-life standpoint, is a way to deliver a substantive good for people, for families, for communities, for our nation, that serves not just the private good of the mother and the father or the child from a financial standpoint, uh, and not even just the good of the limited community, but the whole common good of our nation. Because more Americans, more babies, is good for the country. You can make a GDP argument for why more Americans is great. You know, Matt Iglesias has done this, right? One billion Americans. It's a great vision. But more people and birth support, not just for the act of birth, not just for the pregnancy period, but even afterward for a period of time, is a good substantive thing that serves a common good. Okay, that's the pro-life aspect, is that this is something substantive and affirmative that we can do in the meantime as we work toward abolition. 
that sparks the heart of people, that helps them think they're working toward abolition because they see all these immediate, concrete goods, which are people, one another, that we have to serve. Not just in the meantime, from a, a tactical or pragmatic standpoint, as they achieve a, a political vision long term, but because it's good in and of itself. Okay, that's the pro-life aspect. Then there's the aspect of the good of our country. We're in a time now, I mean, look around. You know, Elon Musk is about this all the time, talking about depopulation, the threat of population collapse. And some people here in this room have grown up with, you know, the, the myth of the population bomb, right? The idea that overpopulation was the problem. And now we're finding out underpopulation is the problem. And we're finding it out fast. Many people have been sold a bill of goods. They're finding themselves, men and women alike, finding themselves later in life. And they were told, you know, pursue your career, pursue your passion. You can have kids later, sometime later. When, uh, whenever, later. Maybe IVF, right? They're told these things. And then when they find out that it's not so easy, that even setting aside the intrinsic evil of IVF, which kills human persons, by its nature, it barely even works, although it lines the pockets of the IVF industry. And so when we talk about the good of the nation when it comes to something like making birth free, we're talking about setting a new standard to recover a bit of the way Americans, the way all of us used to think about life together as a political community, which is to say, not as atomized, radically individuated people who are ultimately in that vision alone and left to face the world alone, the life alone of their community, of their family at best, but rather one where we're all together in a communitarian way, working toward the betterment of ourselves and the good of, of all, right? That's the difference between serving the private good and serving the common good. And we can work toward that vision, certainly from a pro-life standpoint, uh, but also for the, the good of our nation by recognizing that whether you're abortion-minded and you could just use the encouragement of recognizing that as a matter of social policy, as a matter of state policy, America supports birth. It makes it feasible to say yes to life. Or whether you're someone who looks around and you know, you're not abortion-minded, but you just have been told by your employer or by whomever, just make it through the next quarter then maybe you should think about settling down. Just wait for the next bonus. Then maybe you can afford a house to settle down. Just wait until the next milestone. Then you can think about marrying, having a baby. What if instead, in this way that we govern ourselves in this wonderful nation, we made it a matter of state policy to make birth free as a signal to one another that we're all in this together, that we're not alone, that we're not radically individuated, atomized, bouncing around, left to our own devices. And that charity, while it is great, is not the only thing we have to rely upon. So making birth free, and we can get into more of the history of it, um, but I'll pause here for now. Making birth free makes sense for us at Americans United for Life. It makes sense to me, certainly to do for mothers, for fathers, for families, for communities, for a nation. Uh, and I think it, it's a, there's a clear path to do so through Congress. I don't think it's gonna happen tomorrow. I think it's gonna take a number of years, but I think we're in the early stages of an important conversation, and I'm happy to be here with both of you. Thanks, Tom. Um, I will leave the implications of your uh, tobacco analogy for those of us on the other side of that question uh, unexplored for now. Um, Joe and the folks at IHE usually give us uh, plenty of rope to hang ourselves, but I think make cigarettes free would <laughs> be a bridge too far. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, without further ado, uh, Megan. Uh, yeah, so look, I think there are I'm, I'm, I should start by saying I actually agree on a lot of points about about the way that that family that 
the culture and the economy are currently structured, structuring people away from having families and that that's a bad thing. Uh, though I should also disclose that I am one of those uh, childless adults who uh, is constantly being excoriated for having uh, waited until she was 37 to get married and having a career. But um, that said, uh, I don't think that making birth free solves any particular problem. I think that there may be political reasons for the pro-life movement to do it as a kind of good faith gesture. And I think uh, you are kind of hinting at that, is that like this is a way for us to say, like, no, this is not just about forcing women to not have abortions. It's about caring about the child. Right. And I think that that is a good thing in general. I think politically, those are the sorts of gestures you should make. I can see that, you know, symbolically, maybe we, we say society, we want society to make this statement. But um, a few things. First of all, a very high percentage of babies are already born in Medicaid. For those women, birth is free. Um, and so there's actually this weird, it, you know, the problem is in this weird kind of not poor enough to be covered by Medicaid, not rich enough to not care about like a $4,000 deductible, right? And that that is a, a valid group to care about. Um, you know, maybe make deductibles smaller or better pegged to income would be a less sexy slogan, um, but maybe a more reasonable slogan. Because here's how I think about health insurance. And this is a very like economist libertarian way to think about it, which is not necessarily how everyone in this room is going to think about it. But I think of health insurance as the purpose of it is to cover expenses that most people don't have. For the same reason that you don't buy car insurance that covers your gas and oil changes, because that would just drive up the cost of insurance to the price of insurance now, plus gas and oil changes, plus a little extra for a kind for people who are going to profitably decide that they need to, you know, buy premium gas and so forth, rather than settling for a lower octane. Um, and so, it's, it's a very inefficient way to handle insurance. What insurance is for is for pooling risks that people can't cover themselves. Now, there are births that have that sort of risk, and I think that that risk should be pooled, right? If there is, like, to a first approximation, no one can afford if their child. Has uh, is born really early and and spends a year in the NICU. To a first approximation, no one in America can afford to cover that expense, right? That's a millions of dollar expense. Thankfully, that is also a rare expense, and so we pool that risk, and we cover those expenses through insurance. I think that's a very good use of insurance. But the just generally, I am having a normal, healthy birth. I had normal, healthy doctor's appointments. I didn't need anything special. Like there is no way to to come out ahead. <laughs> from that on average. On average, you are going to pay either through taxes or through uh, your insurance premium or through your deductible or out of pocket. One way or the other, you as an average human being, given that most people are going to have children at some point in their life, you as an average human being are going to pay that cost. We can't make birth free. It's Someone's got to pay for it one way or the other, and that someone is going to be, by and large, the same people who are having the babies. Um, and so I don't think that that's a good kind of economic use of health insurance. The other thing I would say about this is that the health insurance market is already a complete mess in large part because we keep saying, you know, we need to do this symbolic thing. You know, birth control has to be covered. Why? It's a very low expense and it's recurring and most people use it. And then other people have religious objections to it. Why do we have to cover it? Because it symbolizes that we care about women's health care. Like, I, I, can, I can care about women's health care without giving people 25 bucks a month to cover the cost of their pills, right? Like, this is, I don't actually think that this is, this is, we need to do that kind of symbolism. And every bit of symbolism that you add that isn't doing a substantive thing of insuring people against risks that they can't afford, it adds regulatory overhead. It means you may have to give a trade. You want to make birth free? Well, they want to add, you know, voluntary sterilization while you're under, <laughs> right? Are you going to make that trade? Now suddenly you're getting into a lot of horse race politics that end up compromising some of the very values you're trying to pursue. Um, but beyond that, you know, it's it adds all of this complexity to a system that is already breaking under all of the layers of complexity. Now, I don't, this is not a, a Jeremiah against any government healthcare system. Uh, you know, I personally opposed Obamacare. I personally would 
uh, prefer a much more market-oriented system than exists anywhere in the world, where you basically, the government insures, again, those risks that no one can pay for. So it would basically kind of pick up all health uh, expenses in a year that go above 10 to 20 percent of your household income with, you know, a lower amount for people who are closer to the poverty line. Um, because I think that preserves price mechanisms. It gives people incentives to shop around. It, it preserves a lot of the stuff that's already gone because of the way that we do health insurance in this in this country, and it gets rid of a lot of the messes. But I don't think that there's no role for government and, and healthcare provision. Um, and I think that there are systems like the Swiss system that, that work pretty well. I would not be unhappy to live under them. That said, the United States tried to copy those systems and failed. Politically, we are not able to do any kind of efficient anything. All we do is keep adding kludges onto a system that's already close to the breaking point. And every time we add another kludge, the system works, works worse. Um, finally, I would say this, is we do, just as a you know, larger question of the good of the country, we have a massive fiscal problem coming down the pike. We gotta pay for our old people. Um, you know, that's also choosing life in some, <laughs> in some way. It is. And we have not done that. We have promised them that we're going to pay for a lot of stuff and we have not put the money aside. I mean, we, we really can't, that's not sort of how government finances work, but that said, we are, we have a, we're a large and growing budget deficit that is driven by these entitlements and we need to pay for them and adding another fiscal problem Adding another thing that we have to pay for doesn't just add regulatory complexity onto the healthcare system. It also adds a burden onto the government when the government is not yet prepared to finance the burdens it's already taken on. So I would really, you know, if we can get Social Security and Medicare finances into reasonably good shape, if we can get our budget deficit down to something that's like, I feel like we can probably carry some something in the one to three percent range, you know, am I going to? really freak out about this program. I'm going to hate it. Is it going to be the worst program I've ever heard? No, that would be student loan forgiveness. But um, <laughs> but that said, I don't see what problem this actually solves. I don't think on the margin that the cost of birth is really what is driving uh, people to not have kids. Um, I think if you were going to look for something for expenses that you were going to try to defray in order to increase the number of people who have kids, I think there's a lot of things I would put before the, the literal medical bills from the, from the birth. Um, and I just, I'm not sure what problem this solves other than kind of a symbolic gesture. And while I'm not entirely against symbolic gestures, I would like them to be cost effective and not break important programs we already have. Thanks. Um, as she showed with her uh, incredibly incisive uh, response just now, Megan, I think when I first started reading her years ago was at The Economist. Uh, if she were still there, uh, I would have the pleasure of being able to address her tonight as Sir. <laughs> <laughs> you go, you do you. <laughs> but um, anyway, I think what we've heard um, from our two panelists sort of establishes, you know, at the sort of opposite end ends of uh, a spectrum, a sort of continuum of how we might think about this question, you know, as a grand sweeping symbolic gesture on the one hand, as um, something that, you know, could add to the deficit on the other hand. Um, and so I guess so I'm sort of interested in uh, whether we can somehow maybe uh, find a way to, to meet in the middle somewhere. Um, Tom, you, you said, you mentioned that uh, you were going to say something just a little bit about where the slogan came from, you know, the sort of origins of this. Um, maybe if you could just say a word about that and then we could talk a little bit about the, um, the sort of transitional period in the history of the, you know, uh, pro-life movement, the sort of conditions that we find ourselves in and why, why there might be uh, talk about symbolic gestures, you know, presenting from the question of their value. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think, too, um, I think that spectrum is a, is a good place to, to put us because I think that's, that's where this strikes most people. They either think, I mean, the responses we've gotten to this at Americans United for Life range from like, heck yes, we should do this. Finally, something I can get behind from a pro-life group to um, questions like you've raised, deficit, fiscal, and what have you. Um, but I think the, the important thing as we talk about this is that this is a substantive proposal 
not a symbolic proposal. Um, there's certainly symbolism involved with it, but good and true symbols point to uh, realities. And the reality would be that everyone would benefit from this. Um, the details uh, to be discussed further. But the background to the question, should birth be free, let's make birth free, really comes from uh, Elizabeth Brunig's uh, great piece in The Atlantic uh, that came out uh, this July. Uh, and she, she posed her piece really in the form of a challenge to the pro-life movement. Uh, this appeared just a few weeks after the Dobbs decision. Uh, and she essentially said that uh, the pro-life movement um, should you know, continue to pursue its aims, but that it had to get serious about um, where the country was uh, and what you know, some of the structural problems are surrounding birth and family formation. So there is, there is the aspect too, certainly for uh, those who are abortion-minded, um, but there is the larger question of, of, is the United States of America really a place that's hospitable, that encourages family formation? I think a lot of people, I mean, I've lived in, in DC about five years now, I think a lot of people in a place like DC would say that it's not. That at best, as a political community, we're sort of indifferent to it. We sort of, you know, gesture toward it. Yeah, that's really good, but that we're not really, that we don't have the thickness of community anymore to make it a default. Um, and so again, I come back to the substantive aspects uh, of this. But you know, Liz's piece was was key for us because it inspired uh, uh, our leadership to come together on this. We spoke in front of Congress later in July and mentioned this. This was our first public uh, use of the phrase, um, and we called on Congress to adopt this as a priority. Uh, we think it's a bipartisan priority. It's a challenge to Democrats. It's a challenge to Republicans. Certainly, a challenge to Democrats uh, who speak about women. Uh, and the rights of women, but seem to only tend to offer them one option, uh, abortion, maybe contraception, uh, don't really offer them choice. And it's a challenge to Republicans who would imagine that either a dearth of regulation in an already highly regulated area of healthcare um, or a radically free market would help people make the choice for life. So it's a challenge to both, but it's, it's also an opportunity I think, to maybe stumble upon together a truly bipartisan program, something that we can be proud of, that can bring Congress together. There's a lot I'd like to do to change the Affordable Care Act. Uh, if I had the votes, I would love to reform it today, you know? Uh, but the, certainly agree on that much. Right, but the votes, the votes ain't there. And, and with that reality, I think, um, you know, we have to operate where we are. And, um, and so that led us to, to formulate this proposal and there's a lot of ways that we can think about it uh, if we want to lower the temperature a bit, right? Which is, uh, how do you pay for something like this? If you were to do uh, the kind of, you know, to put it in ACA type terms, the gold, you know, platinum level uh, of, of something like Make Birth Free, you're talking about adding, you know, 40 to $50 billion in annual expense to the federal budget. We're talking actually in that context then about making such a minor change to the way we spend federally that that would account for about a percent of all current U.S. federal health care spending. We're talking about half of what we sent to Ukraine last year without any substantive debate as far as I could see, whatever your feelings on the Ukraine issue. There wasn't much debate about that. There's not much debate about marginal policy changes to federal healthcare spending, marginal changes to federal education spending. So in that sense, I think there should be a debate about this. There should be a debate about all those things. Um, but I think the, the answer here is a much more resounding yes than it is for most of the things that we're doing either on the margins with most of the spending uh, or, uh, or otherwise. And, just as a, primer, a, a tactical matter in negotiation, we don't want to wait until we're truly set to default on our debt, whenever that happens, to say, oh, we should do this other good thing. I think it but makes... That's the only way we, ta we uh, engage with the question of the debt in this country, right? I mean, look, everything we do, everything that is driving us towards you know, the current madness with Congress, although that's really, you know, Republicans could just not 
play this stupid game. But um, look, everything, it's all $50 billion at a time. Okay, I mean, no, Obamacare was a trillion dollars over 10 years. But like in general, right, there's... A modest s- proposal. So much of what we do is, as there's the old... A joke. This is back when the budget was smaller, a billion here, a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. Um, and you know, this is this is the problem: is like adding things. If you have a proposal where you want to cut something else and you can trade that off, I will be much friendlier to this, right? If you can say like, this is going to be one for one, and it's going to be in the same bill. It's not going to be a package of cuts to come later. Yes. But we're actually going to cut this amount now. I think I would be skeptical that you would get that through Congress. So we've got right now the the U.S. government pays for almost half of all births, right? Yeah. Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Administration, et cetera. Very few on Medicare, but. (laughs) There are some, though. (laughs) There are some uh, for for disabled persons. Uh, And so through these programs, we're paying for nearly half of all births. And we're doing all sorts of other things in terms of our social policy with things like means testing and whatnot, because we don't we tend to not like. I think, universal programs for whatever reason. Uh, This can be one that makes sense. Uh, Again, you know, the Republicans aren't going to vote for Medicare for all. Um, But they might, and the Democrats might vote for birth for all. So let me... I, I hate to like drag this into details, but all of this stuff, having gone through Obamacare, it's all details. And if you think about this, so like think about how this is going to work. You've got a universal program, right? So first of all, um, you can't make doctors take it. So right there, it's not going to be universal. There are going to be some doctors who won't for the same reason there are doctors who won't take Medicare or Medicaid. I mean, like I when when my mother was dying, we were trying, desperately trying to find her a geriatrician. The geriatricians didn't take Medicare. Like, who else is paying you? Uh, and the answer is out of pocket, right? So first of all, I mean, you just have to stop and, and think – in another country, it might be possible to have a program where, like, literally every birth was covered. That's not going to be that's not going to be possible in the United States just because of the way that our our laws work. Um, number two, then you get into the question of like, now, okay, so do I go to a different OBGYN for my birth and then come back to my normal OBGYN for for um, normal well, wellness visits? I think that's. You're, all of these, are you going to do this through the states? Is it going to be federal? All of these things, they're, I mean, they sound like stupid questions, but in fact, they are going to drive, A, back to, the, it's going to cost more than you think. It's not going to be universal. Because, I mean, there is, look, I'm in Kaiser, which is the closest thing that America has to, like, a single-payer NHS-style system. And I'm, it's a voluntary choice. I have another, I have a PPO. I could have more choice of doctors, et cetera. I chose the HMO, despite the fact that I'm a libertarian health policy wonk. Because there's actually stuff that they can do that makes things, I, I know that I'm giving up some choices, right? I know that I don't have the option to go to like this, the absolute best cancer specialist in the entire world if I get cancer, right? But what they, they have integrated healthcare records, so I don't have to do anything. My husband needed surgery, and they just, they had someone whose job was to like call him and tell him everything he had to do. He didn't have to arrange any of it. He didn't make appointments. He didn't, they did all of it for him. Uh, they had all of the records. I've never had to call anyone and get my records transferred. They take care of that. The pharmacy, like, all of it is in one place. It actually works, unlike health portals for other you know, practices that I've dealt with for my parents. Um, and it's great. And if you have an integrated system, you can do that. And you know what? I even think that that might, you know, in general, I am skeptical that healthcare changes are going to reduce what is an outrageous problem with health insurance changes, I should say, are going to uh, be what we need to reduce America's outrageous rate of maternal and infant mortality. Now, some of that is statistical. We are a little more aggressive about counting, say, a stillbirth as as infant mortality rather than a stillbirth. But that said, the rate is too high. Some of the problem, at least, is in the healthcare system. I don't think all of it is. There are also social problems and other things. And I think a better integrated system probably would do a better job. We can literally cannot build that system. It is not possible within the American system because the experience of Obamacare was that like everyone knew that a huge problem was that this m- huge fragmented mess of a system just creates all of these perverse incentives. It makes it hard, for example, to discipline payments to providers because they can always opt out and, and go to some other system. It makes it hard to deliver integrated care, to have the same medical records, all of these things. Everyone wanted to change that. Even the libertarians were like, yes, obviously this is the worst possible system. It's a total mess, right? 
But what politically emerged from Obamacare was you couldn't touch anything that anyone already had, right? Like, because there were political fiefdoms that had that program and were not going to let it go and would go to Congress and lobby Congress and kill, kill your little amendment to the bill. There were people like their insurance. They like their doctor. They don't want you to mess with that. So it has to be a system that doesn't force anyone to do anything that they, they right? Remember, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. Like a million people, I think it was, lost their plan under Obamacare, and they went insane. I would also have gone insane, to be very clear. But the point is that, like, and Congress went immediately went back and grandfathered their plans, even though that made everything even more messed up. Right? The fact is, politically, getting this system under control, creating that, that dream of the integrated care system, of, of everyone having the one thing, it's not politically or legally feasible in the United States. And so what we're actually talking about is making birth probably free for some people or some like variant Which on would be this. a great step. <laughs> but I mean, it's already free for half of the country, right? I mean, almost, yeah. Almost, right? I mean... So again, I go back to what problem exactly are we solving? You're, you're describing <laughs> a, a series of situations of, of sort of, uh, in some cases, like insane things that we've, we've had as a result of the Obamacare debates. And one of my conclusions from that is if we've experienced a whole bunch of insane things in order to preserve uh, fiefdoms or status quos or whatever that don't make sense as a whole, if those things have happened, we can certainly do some sane things for once uh, when it comes to healthcare <laughs> policy. And I think this is one of the few things, as you're saying, that you could do in a single bill that would actually, not just as a talking point, but actually slash existing bureaucracies, reduce existing costs, and deliver a new baseline. You know, one of the things that I'm sympathetic to is a, is a concern of, you know, well, uh, how are people, uh, all sorts of people who maybe want certain types of care, doulas, midwives, uh, who want to be at a birthing center, want to be at a hospital, want to be at home, whatever. Uh, how do we provide a baseline for them? And I think, well, that's what making birth free is all about, creating a baseline uh, of services through the beginning of pregnancy. And then, you know, our proposal at American Center for Life in our policy paper, you know, we lay out the most ambitious case, right? Because why negotiate for less? And we say, you know, that we could even have a paradigm where for the first year or two of the child's life, the family receives, you know, people have called this different things, a baby bonus or direct payments or whatever, whatever the terminology is, but support for the family. And so I know, I know, you know, we can have the, the sort of ACA and bureaucracy uh, conversation, but I think when you were coming back to what problem does this actually solve? I mean, I think, you know, uh, there are some, some babies here in this room. Uh, my own included, uh, and uh, you know. Also, many former babies. I see many <laughs> former babies. Yes, very handsome and 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 darling former babies, uh, and and we all know in our own family environments there are tremendous challenges to family formation. I mean, in my own case, I'll share. Uh, you know, uh, our son John was born in October. He's about six months now. Last February. Uh, you know, I was out after a, a work event and at a dinner and I got a call from my wife and, you know, it's what you don't want to hear. She says, you know, I'm bleeding. And, you know, your mind immediately goes to a miscarriage is taking place. And so I say, you know, get to the hospital. I'll meet you there. Uh, we, we went out to the Inova uh, Hospital in Northern Virginia. We got there and, and after a long night, thanks be to God, uh, it, it turned out that it was it was not a miscarriage. Uh, these things happen sometimes, and uh, a bonus was we got an ultrasound. We got a very early ultrasound of, of uh, uh, the person who turned out to be my son, uh, and it was an amazing experience from that standpoint. But that ER visit cost us a few thousand dollars uh, out of pocket, even after insurance, right? And we all we all know the ACA didn't actually make healthcare more affordable, right? Uh, so it, it, that's been also one of the problems of it is that it's, it's maybe made healthcare more accessible, but it also came at the cost of excluding all sorts of things uh, or driving up premiums in general uh, and driving up deductibles as well. And so you compare, uh, you know, where we are now to where we could be, where we are now being like our experience was a few thousand dollars for the ER. We ended up getting a, a doula, which was fantastic. I think probably helped my wife avoid the epidural and a, a C-section. And was, she was able to deliver without pain meds or anything. It was a wonderful experience for her and an amazing experience for me to stand by her side and, and watch our son come into the world. 
at the end of the day, that was, I mean, all told probably about $6,000 uh, out of pocket, after insurance, at least. Um, where we work at Americans United for Life, we're fortunate to have a nice health care plan. We have a thing called the EBC. They reimburse even those expenses. And so in our case, John's birth for us was free because this EBC reimbursed all those expenses, uh, the deductibles, the premiums, the co-pays. Um, that should be a standard thing for everyone. Again, when we're talking about what's possible versus not possible, what's possible is Congress writing checks every day for things that we've never even thought existed. You know, that's the status quo. We can certainly do something good, substantive, that's oriented toward the common good and not just private goods of special interests or other people uh, by making birth free for all. So before we um, maybe pivot to some questions um, from folks here in the audience, one thing I was hoping that we would talk about that um, Megan touched on briefly, um, which I think is really important, is the question of to what meaningful extent, if any, these, um, these costs, which are real for people who fall into that you know, interesting space. The, the same exact people occupy the same space, by the way, if we're talking about like higher education, right? The people for whom, you know, these enormous five or six figure, you know, tuition bills, you know, write the check, whatever, or people who are going for free. Um, and it's, you know, people in the middle being squeezed. To what extent though, is the fear of that six fig, you know, $6,000 bill an obstacle to family formation, to marriage. Personally, when I look out at the United States today and um, the changed kind of uh, cultural and social traditions, um, uh, the role of um, women in the workforce, you know, at first in, in sort of in the professions, you know, um, but eventually as, you know, by starting in the 70s, you know, as a kind of default, something arising out of, you know, um, economic necessity as a temporary thing to, you know, by the 1990s, you know, essentially an expectation. When I think about the, um, when I think about the basic shape of American society, I think I can point to a few things other than fear of, uh, you know, a, a four-figure bill that might, you know, stand as obstacles. Um, and one is, you know, one thing that I, I would just venture to point out is that when you have a culture in which marriage is delayed and in which, you know, having children is something that's either delayed or that's considered, you know, a sort of um, luxury good that you save for and, uh, you know, purchase in your late 30s or maybe even your early 40s. For those people who do choose to, you know, have some kids in their 20s or whatever, you know, with utter heedlessness, it's a pretty grindingly miserable, lonely, atomized world of, like, empty parks and sort of shabby playgroups and unruly, underfunded homeschooling co-ops and stuff. And I, I, I just, I mean, it's a world that I'm sure Tell me more about, about, about why people should have more children. Yeah, right. So anyway, I was just wondering, maybe start with Megan and go to Tom, you know, um, when I think about what, what you say about what problem is this meant to solve, one plausible answer would be the problem of the, you know, perceived social problem of people not having children and families. But I, I would have to say, even though I'm with Tom on the, the broader symbolic point, and I also you know, think that budget deficits are fake, and you could just print money. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm I see we're coming back next comments. week for another debate. Um. <laughs> um, so look, as an economics journalist, I think on the margin, is there somewhere out, someone, somewhere out there in the United States who's been like, I'd like to have a third kid, but I can't swing the deductible? Probably. 
right? In a country of 330 million people, I can find you any person who's like someone who is doing almost anything you can imagine. But I don't think that that's why people aren't having kids. I mean, I think one thing that you're getting at is it's a collective action problem. The optimal time to have kids is when all of your friends are having kids, right? Exactly then. You should all ideally conceive on the same night, have them all at the same time, so that then you can, like, all of you, you, you are missing zero bar nights, right? You found a more provocative proposal than make birth <laughs> yes. free. This is um, <laughs> so this is, this is maybe the engagement that... Um, so... I think that, like, honestly, I think babies are, are, they are competing somewhat with work and a lot with fun. Um, they're competing with more entertaining things than small things that spit up on you a lot. Now, the small things are cuter and they are more meaningful than Netflix. Infinitely. Right. I agree with that. I am not saying that this is a good choice, but in, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of ways in which modern life enables you to make bad short, good short-term decisions that are bad long-term decisions. Um, and I think that this is one way in which modern life is sort of structured to encourage a very rewarding good short-term decision, which is to spend more time like going to spring break in Cancun and watching awesome Netflix things and hang out with your friends. Um, that will, I think, over the course of your life, probably be a, a choice that a lot of those people will regret. Most of those people would probably rather have had another kid, right? When, you know, at the end, when we're summing it all up, but they're not making that decision because right now, I mean, have you seen Fortnite? It's super fun. Like you could, um, and so this is why I don't think free birth solves that problem. I would also say that I understand the the argument for a kind of like symbolic. We're gonna we're gonna say this is who we are as a society, and then work towards that. But I tend to think that politics is downstream of culture, and not the other way around. I think there is some back and forth. But ultimately, if I wanted to change this, I would be working on the culture and the workplace structure, not on on the government. I think that the the evidence for any government program, including much more aggressive programs that aimed to like give people big chunks of cash for having kids the evidence of efficacy is just extremely low. And by the way, even as libertarian, because I, I think that kids are good and also because I think that social security is really in trouble, I would be open to some of those programs if I thought they worked, but they don't. Um, and so if you can't, you know, if you can't get people to have more kids by say giving them a much, if you can't get people to have more kids by putting them in a Nordic welfare state, or like, then how are you going to get them to have more kids by lowering their health insurance deductible, right? I think that I just don't see how, again, maybe a tiny, very marginal difference, but I don't think that that's actually what's, what's driving this shift. And I think that um, there are two dangers of doing things that like kind of symbolically address problems. First of all, is that those things often, I would, I'm tempted to say, usually substitute for things that actually attack the problem, right? It's a way of, it's like why people like going to protests instead of doing the hard work of like actually going out and, and healing racial divisions in their own uh, community. The second one is hard and no one really knows how to do it. And the first one's fun. And like you're with your friends and you feel important. And like then you can go home and have a beer and not like worry about whether you did it right. You showed up, you did it right. You did everything you were supposed to do when you're protesting. It's just that it doesn't work very well. And so I think that the, that's one danger of the symbolic thing. And the other thing is that they, they have unintended side effects. They have, you know, they have um, sort of perverse consequences, they're costly. And, and for those reasons, I think, while I, I, I get the argument, I, I don't buy it. So there's a, an aspect to this, I think we're talking about the government, right? And you know, all sorts of terrible things come into your mind, at least for me, sometimes we think about the government. I mean, it's like, you know, you think of Reagan's famous quip, right? Uh, the most dangerous words in language are when the government's here to help you. But I think we've moved into a different period in our political dialogue where we can separate the government from something like state policy. Um, whether you're talking on the local level, like you know, if a local municipal government uh, wants to do something like uh, you know, put a playground in the park, this depressing park where the families aren't, right? You know, that's a good thing. That's a that's a, a sort of a state policy. 
um, that's good. And it's done at a very local level, so it maybe is more achievable. But there are also all sorts of things we can do on a national level that are state policy. And it doesn't need to be uh, like the government doing it. It can be just our elected representatives. Uh, and many things, I think, you know, you just look over the past century of American history uh, that we thought, you know, maybe didn't give enough thought to how transformative they would be, whether for good or ill. Uh, I mean, take something like the interstate highway system. On one level, you can say like, yeah, we're gonna create an interstate highway system because it's important to knit the country together and there's all these important strategic, you know, military value to this. There's also uh, the inter intercommercial uh, aspect to this as well and it's good because people are having more cars and all this stuff. But it fundamentally changed our relationship to the country. Yeah, we have cool things like you can go on a road trip now, so much easier, right? So much quicker, you can miss all the stuff. That's the point of going on a road trip. Um, but, but the interstate highway system changed our entire market the entire way we conduct commerce and that we buy and sell and exchange, it transformed the country. I go back further to something like public schooling. So this is, I mean, I think public schooling is maybe one of the more obvious bases to think about making birth free, which is that it's a good that we're all educated, that we have a baseline where even if you're not sending your kids to school, you're, you're expected to homeschool them or whatever, they're expected to achieve a level of attainment because it's not just good for them, it's not just good for their private good, but it's our common good that we're educated as citizens together and we all pay for it. Yes, there's a cost, right? Property taxes, not to mention the federal side of things, but the property taxes ensure that schooling reflects the communal reality of our country, which is that we're not isolated, atomized individuals, but that we're in it together. So that even if you don't have kids, or you know, if you're you know, on the extreme end of, you, know, you think that the world is about to end and you've gone, you know, you're in Portland, Oregon, and you've gone out and you've sterilized yourself, well, you're still paying your property taxes. You're still paying for the good of your community. Thanks be to God for that. We can do the same thing. We can apply the same principle to making birth free to help realize at least on a base level. Yeah, we can say on one level, ah, you know, what's a couple thousand dollars gonna do to change people's perspectives? I think it's gonna do a heck of a lot. A couple thousand dollars for most people is a couple thousand dollars. It's not nothing. But I think on the broader level, getting us to a point where we all realize, yeah, we are in this together. You know, however many kids my wife and I have that God blesses us with, you know, we're gonna wish we had more. There's data on this, right? I mean, American women respond uh, to this, they, they always say they had, that, that they wish they had one more kid than they do. I think that's one of the most fascinating things public polling's revealed. And it reveals what a gift children are, um, but it also reveals that we recognize the abundance that they bring in to not just our families, but the world. And so I think uh, on, a, on a broad social level, a transformative level, like public schooling, like the interstate highway system, you know, making birth free knits us all closer together and it has the chance, again, not just from a symbolic standpoint, not, not just a facade of something where there's an inner lack or a, a hollow center, but that there's a reality, a substantive reality, where we realize we are in this together. Thanks be to God, however many kids I have, yeah, you know, tax dollars, which who knows what most of them are doing, are going to support the strengthening and the growth and the fabric of our country. That's something I can get behind as an American. All right, well, should we turn it over to uh, questions here? I think we have a mic to go around. As always, I just remind everyone that um, questions should be at least reasonably brief, but more important, they should be questions, not <laughs> manifestos or proposals of marriage, all the panelists are. Smoking. I think everyone on this panel yeah. is married, which well, uh, yeah. complicates that even further. <laughs> um, so yeah, right, uh, we'll start here in the front. I just want to thank uh, everyone for coming tonight. Uh, we talked a lot about this issue from a national level, but I was wondering if there's any uh, way we could talk about make birth free at a state level where the governments it might be more likely to get passed, especially in states that have like Republican supermajorities. And I don't know if there's, if you could talk about any ideas if they have been proposed in the states and possibly how that could, you know, get done on a local level versus a national level. 
Sure, yeah, so I think uh, it's still a new idea, right? Liz Brunig wrote her piece last July, right after Dobbs. Uh, Americans United for Life put out our policy paper in January. We have seen interest in Congress. Hopefully Congress acts, um, but you're right. I mean, on the state level, there's things that could be done. Uh, you look at the history of Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Care Act was preceded by Romney Care, right, among other things. Uh, and Not a recommendation. <laughs> you know, but it is a sign of what you could do at a state level in terms of state policy. And so... So is, you know, just trying to think about this, because we've sort of employed earlier the analogy of um, these tiny insects. Um, anyway, um, we... It was we, a fly, if that's not visible on the live stream. We... Um, <laughs> We've used college education as an analogy, you know, on a couple of occasions, in part because the people who are hit most hard by the kind of funding thing, you know, the, the problem of, you know, actually getting these bills, it's roughly the same sort of portion of society. But um, I hear I would defer to um, Megan's superior knowledge and expertise, but isn't it the case that in Texas, They've come up with some kind of scheme where roughly high school students who get like a 3.0 or a 3.5 can go to any state school and yeah, come sort out of. I mean, there are capacity yeah, constraints, like, but yes, yeah. you like you're you're guaranteed admission to and and it was, it was an answer to affirmative action, right? It was that we we can't do affirmative action. Instead, we're going to do this. We're going to say if you graduate in the top 10 percent of your class, um, you can go to a flagship state school and. It seems to work reasonably well. I mean, Texans seem pretty happy about it. I just remember, it. I think that they have, you know, comparatively low, like, levels of student indebtedness compared to other states. Uh, I don't, the answer is that I don't know. Um, and while I am tempted to pretend that I do, I will just say I don't know. I think there's an important principle, though, on the state level conversation. Um, you know, I mentioned in my opening kind of comments about the important role of charity. It's a fantastic thing that the pro-life movement, uh, among many achievements, has helped grow something like 2,700 plus pregnancy resource centers across the country. And I know that's, that's something that comes to mind when you think about making birth free, you know, especially for abortion-minded women. Well, what about all those crisis pregnancy centers? Aren't they there to help people? And you think, yeah, they are. But that can't be long-term policy. The, the pregnancy centers have arisen because of a lack of state action, uh, actually hostility toward the good in the case of this uh, issue of abortion. Uh, and so while I hope that pregnancy resource centers flourish on the state level, especially going forward, and I think states like Texas and Florida are great examples where you have $100 million in Texas, $25 million now in Florida, thanks to Ron DeSantis, for pregnancy resource centers, there you're seeing uh, a shift from these things that were purely charitable stop gap, filling a gap, to now being supported by state policy. Uh, and so I think you can do something similar with, with making birth free. All right, in the, uh, up here, second row. Thank you uh, very much, Tom and Megan, for coming out today. Um, Megan, I just have a question about something. Me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a culpa. Um, but Thank you, Matt. <laughs> But Megan, you said the famous uh, Andrew Breitbart line that um, politics is downstream of culture. I guess, what would you say to the inverse that culture is a downstream of politics and that the way that the government acts will affect the culture, that the law, in a sense, is a teacher? And you take a look at countries like Hungary, for example, that have pro-natal, pro-family policies that help spur this very pro-family country and to a point that was made earlier, they recognize the, the, the need and that some women want to have one more children that they have, and it just turns the country in a more family-friendly direction. So I guess what your thoughts on that would be? Um, look, I do think that, that certainly the government can shape culture. Um, and like one example with that, of that would actually be welfare where I think the existence of welfare and the way that welfare policies shaped up in the 1960s actually had a lot to do with the development of an underclass. Of, there's a, an amazing story in Jason DePerle's American Dream, which chronicles welfare reform in 1996 um, and follows three women through it. And one of the most amazing facts in that book was that of these women in their mid-30s, um, none of the three had ever been to a wedding. 
right? And I think that that actually really was downstream of choices that were made about, for example, cutting off your welfare benefits if you got married, um, that then led to an epidemic of fatherlessness and made things a lot worse for poor people in America. So yes, do I think government can affect culture? I do. That said, let's think about another symbolic way in which the government attempted to change the culture, and that is abortion. And the Supreme Court very clearly thought that they were settling the question, that they were going to, you know, they were like a little ahead of the culture, but they were going to, they were going to fix it. They were going to say women had a right to an abortion unlimited in the first trimester, you know, fairly unlimited in the second trimester, right? Didn't fix it. In fact, polling stayed remarkably clear on that, despite the fact that for decades, literally, the rejoinder was, right, this is settled law. It turns out that as soon as the Supreme Court changed the settled law to something else, the people who thought that that was settled law don't like settled law as an argument anymore. But, um, <laughs> but like, it, it never did settle the argument because, in fact, there's a lot of really complicated value questions in there that didn't get fixed because some government official came and said, no, the official policy of the U.S. government is that abortion is moral until, you know, the 20 to the 24th week. And I think similarly, you know, making birth free, I don't think that's really going to change attitudes towards birth and family. I don't think that making that symbolic statement, it's not like we've... We're, we're altering our symbolic statement that in fact the United States hates babies. You know, politicians still get up and talk about like families and babies. They like them, they hug them, um, somewhat to the baby's distress often. But like, um, so I am skeptical that this is one of those examples. I think we're, um, you know, maybe on the margin it would change it merely because some people would decide to have kids and then that would normalize it. But like, again, I just, I, I struggle to see where covering someone's health health insurance deductible for a birth is, I mean, because babies are super expensive, right? Like, you know, again, on the margin, maybe a little bit, but I just don't think that that's what's driving when I talk to, when I talk to people in their 20s who are delaying marriage and family, like the cost of giving birth has, I think, literally never come up. Babies, babies are only expensive, though. You know, you see those figures of like a baby is going to cost a quarter million dollars. That's like assuming you're paying for their college tuition and sending them to all these things. The, the actual cost of a baby, especially in the first few years of life, is not that. Oh come high. on! Like, what is it? At least fifty thousand dollars in plastic toys, to judge from all yeah, of my right. friends. Living well, you know, right? you, like, you can go Nordic and get the wooden <laughs> toys. You know, <laughs> yes. but uh, but but truly, right? Like, the, the, if it, depending on how you yeah. choose to live, the cost is not actually that significant. I think that's one of the things. The, one of the the misnomers that our cultures put us in which is that, uh, you know, that there are so many uh, sort of implicit triggers we come across that, that sort of say, yeah, that's, that's not the right time. That's not the right thing for me. And so, you know. Uh, before I uh, take another hand here, I should have mentioned earlier that uh, I believe we have the technical capacity to accept a question from uh, people uh, joining us uh, via live stream. So why don't I, I'll go ahead and take one more here in the physical audience and then um, see if we have any that come in on the computer. I haven't got my glasses. Are there any women raising their hands? <laughs> yes, we'll take right here, second row. Hi, I just had a question as someone who works in the medical field. If there's been discussion about the quality of care if we offer free birth, in my experience, any time in the medical field, which is wrong, you put free on anything. The quality of care typically goes down. Um, so I was just wondering if there was any discussion around that. I think that that's a, uh, a great thing to bring up, and it's something that I had hoped we actually would have had a little more time for. Um, my wife working um, you know, as a birth assistant uh, and occasionally as a, um, as a doula you know, in a volunteer capacity, one of the reasons that she does that is that it allows her to give that kind of, I mean, in one sense, like as far as like the way that um, the way that it's experienced, you know, because we have an economy and not a society, it's a sort of premium experience of 
gosh, being able to go give birth in a beautiful, comfortable, um, you know, homey environment with, you know, women who aren't trying to push you through in an assembly line manner and, uh, you know, force you into this, you know, never ending cycle of unnecessary interventions that, you know, can have negative consequences in themselves, but also negative consequences for future births. Um, you know, one thing that she's able to do is give women who otherwise, you know, would be, say, giving birth, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, under circumstances where it would be paid for um, by Medicaid, you know, the opportunity to experience that. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know what uh, about the experience of my other panelists, but certainly my my wife's firsthand experience is that the way that the the circumstances under which we treat women who are currently giving birth, you know, whose births are being paid for by Medicaid, are frequently, you know, appalling. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in general, right, the minute you make something free, the government then has the incentive to push down the cost of that. Doctors don't like that. So you like they, they either look for ways to cut costs or they look for ways to exit the program. I think there's um, generally a lot of, of issues with that. And I would expect to see those sorts of issues arise as well. I, I should just say, though, that, you know, um, this is one of those things where, you know, as Megan said earlier, for some reason, we can't do anything in this country. Because if you compare... We're very um, good at invading other countries. I mean, it, not so much winning after we do, but I, yeah. I feel like that, the invasion part of our government works pretty well. Um, well I mean, we have, we have jazz and college football and you know, a few other big hits. But, um, <laughs> but you know, if you look at the National Health Service you know, in Britain, where the default is midwifery, and um, in part as a consequence of rationing, but in part as just a kind of cultural understanding, you know, the, the default is towards, you know, kind of um, low intervention, you know, very mom-focused, you know, care of the type that in the United States would be something essentially that you're having to pay, you know, a private provider sometimes, you know, huge amounts of money for. Um, so it can be done, but I guess we just can't have uh, nice things. Wait, um, have we got a question from the... Uh... Hello. Okay, so this is from the live stream. Why is Make Birth Free a better campaign than a simple universal child allowance? If you're in uh, the world of like policy wonkery, I think a universal child allowance uh, sounds like a great idea. Um, but it's hard, I think, if you put yourself in the shoes of the average senator or congressperson uh, out there on the stump talking to people in their communities uh, to explain you know, the ins and outs of a universal child care allowance versus a very tangible, concrete thing that most people in the community will have lived through. So I don't, I don't know that on its face it's, it's worse, um, but it's, I think, a lot less compelling and more to the point, it lacks uh, one of the central values of making birth free, which is that knitting together of the social fabric that has so frayed because, you know, uh, universal child care allowance implies what? You're on your own. We're going to send you a check and, you know, figure out how to spend it. Good luck. See ya. Making birth free in community, however, though, and with the purpose of, of building strong families and setting that as a baseline, communicates, I think, a very different message. It communicates something beyond the economic and beyond the material, um, but, but actually points to the spiritual reality at the heart of our politics. Um, just trying to, I actually have, have misplaced my watch. Have we got time for a couple more? Yeah, do more. All right, um, in the black second to the last row. So is the goal is to promote more birds. Why not to have a different fight? And the fight would be against powerful forces that are currently working very hard 
to essentially obliterate the family as an institution. When we have national leaders who make statements such as children do not belong to their parents, belong to the entire community, or statements such as you know, parents don't have any uh, saying in their children's education. So I think that winning that fight will be much more helpful to actually helping uh, and incentivizing people to have more babies. That's my opinion. I mean, I think that this is right, that the, the cultural kind of bias towards having families has changed. And, you know, there's the poll recently that said that most parents, like, worry a lot about whether their kids are going to be financially successful, but not at all about whether their kids are going to have kids. Um, and so I think that, yes, the, that is the actual important fight in terms of natalism. Um, but I will say, like, in defense, it's a really hard fight to have. No, If anyone knew how to do that, then they would already have done it, right? It's actually a really difficult fight to have because, again, Fortnite is awesome. And, um, and people like money. So, you know, those are more difficult fights to have. There, you know, there's something stigmatized, like, like as a woman who got married at 37, you know, I think about what my life would have been like in 1955, not fun. Um, and so, like, people don't want to be mean to single women, which was a big component of that bias towards families. <laughs> and I, like, as a former single woman, I, I'm in favor of not being mean to us. Um, and, like, but I think that, that by and large, you are correct that that's where the change has to happen, not, not in the kind of, like, small, small bore policy things. All right. Um... I think I think too. Just on that on that question, the uh, the the realities of where we are as a country. There's no question, right? That that so many things that, uh, seem to be degenerating, falling apart. Uh, not to mention unfunded in many cases. Um, but the things that we can prioritize, uh, we should prioritize. And especially for those of us who are pro-life or um, perhaps especially conservative, if you think of yourself as fiscal conservative, something like making birth free should be one of the core priorities because it does reorient our social policy. It reorients our thinking about what is achievable, what can be done, and what should be done. And it, it takes us, uh, w without diminishing the spiritual realities, which is I think what you're pointing to, it keeps us at the heart of politics, which is to say uh, at the heart of, of making decisions about our policy, our law and policy, that do redound upon the culture. Uh, and I think there's a great tendency uh, within the pro-life community, but also within the conservative world, to preemptively remove ourselves from making law and policy, from that realm. It's sort of that like, oh, the government type of thing, right? Uh, where we don't even come to the table because we think to do so is either fruitless or it's just going to make things worse or pick your reason. But the result is when you don't show up to the table, you don't, you're not even negotiating. You've lost. And so I think, I think there's a role to play from that on a pragmatic level, even recognizing the spiritual realities. All right. Oh, we've got a, one baby crying in the back. That's my John. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Uh, over there, and then maybe we'll roll out. Hi. Um, don't you think considering the goal of free birth is to help the creation of middle class families and help them, don't you think a more effective way of helping families would be to increase the child tax credit and, inc and decrease the overall income tax burden on American families? I think that we should definitely lower the uh, tax burden on my American family and <laughs> quadruple the child tax credit and make it fully refundable and all that. Yes. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't view it as an either or. I think um, there. Are, you know, I've had conversations with our friends at the. You know, IFS. I think uh, they have great perspectives. Uh, uh, Patrick Brown. Uh, you know, was someone I'm in touch with, and I think he comes at this from a, a place of. Um, you know, he's written a lot about Make Birth Free, and he's coming at it from a place of, uh, of kind of the more policy wonk world. And I think that's important. Uh, it's important to engage with those things and see what our alternatives are. Um, but I, and this might be an aesthetic thing or a personal style thing or something, but I tend to shy away from uh, the impulse to say, like, let's make 
marginal changes. You know, it's in, in the world where it's like, you know, the, the Democrats are bad because they want a tax rate of 27%, and we're good because we want one of 23.8%, right? It's like, does that fire the heart of most people? No, right? Like, no wonder they're not coming out to vote because uh, you're not drawing a meaningful distinction for anybody. Uh, and, and so, uh, like, while I, I think that those are, are important things that, that could help, uh, certainly lowering the tax burden, right? I think there are things that could be adapted. Uh, someone mentioned the Hungarian experience, uh, the idea that they've adapted there where I think it's if you have, uh, I think it's if you've had a, your fourth baby, um, the mother is exempted from uh, personal income tax. I think that's a very interesting thing because it gets around one of the challenges that we have here, which is we have a concern. We don't want to push people out of the workforce while at the same time we don't want to artificially keep them in it, you know, for the purpose of like keeping health insurance or something. Um, the Hungarian model seems to pr provide a way where you're saying you're providing a concrete good for the mother, which is, you know, if you have X number of kids, then you're totally exempt after as a, a decrease over time, right, with the second, third kid. Um, but it also implies that the mother's still working because you're not going to get no taxes if you're not earning income. And so they're not, you know, the Hungarian model isn't pushing women out of the workforce when they have four kids. It's actually, in a certain sense, incentivizing continued participation and providing a social benefit. So yeah, it's like we, we should have lower taxes. We should have models to do that. Um, we should work toward all these things. But I don't think that needs to become an either or, you know, make birth free or this other thing. I mean, look, if we're going to subsidize something through the tax code, uh, I certainly prefer babies to mortgage interest, employer-sponsored yes. health insurance, <laughs> any number of other incredibly dumb things that we have chosen to subsidize through the tax code. For all that I love my mortgage interest deduction, I like. I, I, or I, or high income state taxes in, in blue yeah. states. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, high state. Like, like I daily will these things to go away. So like if we have to, <laughs> if we, if we could trade off one of those, I would take it in a second. That said, um, I, I again express skepticism that on the margin, that's going to make much difference mostly because like people are bad at predicting their tax liabilities, like really bad at it. Um, taxes are complicated. Do you have any idea what you're going to pay in five years on taxes? No, because it's too complicated and crazy. So I'm skeptical that it's like going to incentivize much. Um, and there are arguments. I am not necessarily endorsing them, but I think that they are reasonable and worth looking at. Um, that this could dis that this could disincentivize labor force participation in a way that like actually might not be great for families over the longer run. All right. Well, um, on that note, I'll just end by saying that you know it's becoming more and more common for people to um, analogize to Hungary, which you know is a small and very interesting Central European country. But if we're gonna use that as an example, we should talk about my favorite small European country, which is Liechtenstein, where I believe that uh, they have single-payer healthcare and no income tax because all government functions are funded by you know, non, uh, subjects of His Majesty the Crown Prince visiting the state-owned art galleries and that like funds the whole thing. So if we could come up with that particular like constellation of wonkiness, you know, we would solve Or if we could arrange problems. to be Norway, small company, small country, large fossil fuel deposits, that would also be. Yes. We, we could get to a place where we recognize that we are our own greatest treasure. That's what I think Making Birth Free is about at the end of the day, that, that people are not just our greatest resource in a material sense, but in a, a true spiritual and communitarian sense. Uh, and and that's, that's what I think we're missing today. That's why I think this is so exciting to talk about. All right, well, thank you again, everyone, for coming, and we can continue the conversation over here.